the most sinister thing that came out this week was really um, not exactly news. It was a uh, uh, interview with a Mr. Bingy, I believe, who used to work for the NSA, and I'll give you the title on this. And all this I'll post in the comments below. Uh, and he describes in chilling detail what we've all suspected, which is that every email you send, every phone call you make, every activity you do online is recorded and stored by the United States government. The, the data amounts that he's describing describe wholesale vacuuming. Uh, he's talking about 10 gigabit per second pipes for processing email real-time, uh, massive amounts. <clears throat> and this, of course, ties into the story with Petraeus, who, as Mr. Bingy points out, broke no laws and yet had his career destroyed. And I have no particular affection for David Petraeus. I just am looking this in the abstract as a person who, interestingly, uh, contradicted the White House considerably in October about the Benghazi affair, the assassination of Ambassador Chris Stevens, and then sh just days after the election had his career destroyed and was driven out. And General Allen did not have an affair with the woman in question. He simply exchanged a massive number of emails which uh, should not have been disclosed to the public. Again, his career was destroyed. So this is what will happen to us, is the is fear that one has, is that if one gets on their bad list, one will be targeted. And a friend of mine exposed a bug in a major telecoms system, and uh, he, nobody hacked them, no damage was done in this particular activity. Uh, and uh, he felt he was doing the public a service by publicizing it and he had to plead guilty to a felony uh, for simply trying to bring a matter to light from an obsolete law from the 1980s which said to even use Google you not needed permission. Uh, I'm going to look into this law and give you more details about it later, but in the 80s um, the systems for online communication that were free were supposed to only be used by education and I was working in business at the time, we weren't supposed to use these systems for business. So you did, in fact, need permission for early online systems. <clears throat> so uh, I have seen somebody targeted and destroyed, and a felony conviction is not a, a, a light matter. It is a, really a life sentence when you think about it. I met a young lady recently who worked in a classified capacity overseas. And after I talked about politics with her, she sent me an email asking me to teach her hacking and how she wanted to be a rebel. And this woman was either incredibly naive or engaging in some form of uh, entrapment because, uh, first of all, I'm not a hacker. I am a computer scientist, a network engineer, uh, but uh, I make networks uh, fast. I don't uh, hack other people's networks. So. Um, I found this bizarre, and I found it bizarre that somebody would send me such a request in an email form. Um, that's just my own uh, tale. So in the case of Libya, we have a new group who are being suppressed uh, violently. Let's see if I can get this for you. So in addition to uh, blacks, women, a third of the Libyan tribes, Gaddafi supporters, Sufi Muslims, uh, Africans, uh, foreign workers, all being ruthlessly suppressed and harassed. The latest group are gays. And this particular article, uh, one of the things that I found most horrible, here are the beating marks, I believed. Oh, this, he received, okay, of a man's back with a henna tattoo. No, that's a henna tattoo. But in this particular case, they uh, said, um, mount them like a camel, let them see bullets, ride them like camels, flog them hard. Uh, and uh, then the guy goes on to say this didn't happen under Gaddafi because 
the Gaddafi officials that were gay would have been outed, but this is what they all say. They say something good about Gaddafi, and then fearing for reprisal, they qualify it. Like a, I read an article about a woman who said, women in Libya had much greater rights under Gaddafi, but they were basically whores. This is what a woman said, be, uh, because I, uh, it's just uh, uh, disgusting. Um, so when we think about these terrorists, and we think about Gaddafi supporters, and we think about communists, you can basically put a label on people and do whatever you want to them. You can kill them, jail them, torture them, disappear them, and the U.S. no longer has any moral authority to complain. That was one of the funny things in some of the recent conflicts was uh, how can we complain about the Libyans having uh, um, uh, life imprisonment without trial uh, when we're doing the same thing here. To me, the zeitgeist, the feeling of the times this week, is one of a utterly immoral and lawless ruling class. If Congress, the Supreme Court, and the executive branch all utterly and routinely violate our civil rights in the name of fighting terrorism, what example are they setting? Now, these guys say, we're the good guys, don't worry. But what happens when the bad guys get a security apparatus that has been developed like the U.S.? It's uh, just absolutely chilling. And there's no guarantee they aren't the bad guys already. And my own suspicions are, if we look at J. Edgar Hoover, he had files on everyone to keep them in line. And we see various people who seem somewhat promising who go into the system and seem utterly transformed, almost like something out of Westworld uh, or um, Replicants or uh, Night of the Invasion of the Body Snatchers. And, so, uh, if there was a J. Edgar Hoover before, imagine the massive power they have now. It would be like J. Edgar Hoover with Moore's Law. Uh, millions, billions, trillions, quadrillion times more powerful. And these things are run by the Department of Homeland Security, which is the lowest morale and lowest self-evaluation of any federal agency. Uh, it's in the bottom three. And um, it's been accused of massive waste at these centers that consolidate all this information, which are called fusion centers, which are uh, in and of themselves their very existence is massive waste. Um, uh, let's see. So my question is, why should any of us obey the law anymore when our leaders themselves are lawless? Um, it's very depressing. I don't view it as an opportunity. The rule of law has ended. We no longer have due process of law, so therefore our, our legal system has now rolled back to prior to 1250 AD when rule of law was established uh, against the King John of England, who you might remember at least from A.A. Uh, a. Milne. Uh, King John was not a good man, and, um, and also we have no habeas corpus, we have no right to confront our accusers, uh, no posse comitatus. Uh, the right to avoid arrest by the military in our own country. All these things have been rolled back. We have plunged our legal system into a dark age. So what is our contract? So what I've been doing recently is going through the founding of the country, the Federalist Papers, reading about Jefferson, Hamilton, uh, John Locke, Aristotle, and uh, trying to figure out how we can get ourselves out of this mess by looking at what worked. And uh, the golden age of America seems to have been from uh, when the, the founders uh, came into being politically in the mid-1770s up until the last founder's last presidency, which was Monroe, who was uh, friendly with the ideas of Madison and Jefferson. And then came Andrew Jackson, who to me is the beginning of a dark age because he utterly disregarded the Supreme Court under Marshall, uh, who had said that Cherokee Indians had to be treated in a decent fashion, and he said, make me. So he was sort of the first uh, George Bush uh, for me. Um, so Israel also is behaving in the same sort of unaccountable, impunitist, uh, unilateralist fashion, massively expanding settlements into the lands that Palestinians would receive in any long-term peace agreement, making any sort of idea of a Palestinian state virtually impossible. 
and I just don't understand Israelis anymore. I had a lot of Israeli friends and I studied Judaism. My father wrote his dissertation about the mistreatment of Jews and I just am absolutely baffled. Uh, so, you know, the head of the Palestinian Authority, Abu Mazen, has virtually stopped all violence against uh, Israel for years. And what has he gotten? Just a continued mistreatment of people. Palestinians do not have the right to vote. Um, yet Israelis move into their areas and create settlements, and they're allowed to vote. So what kind of justice is that? Uh, they have lower equal rights than blacks did in the United States and non-slave states. Uh, prior to the Civil War. Think about that. <clears throat> so, the solution is to radically transform our society. It will probably take 20 years of hard work. A growing number of people are involved in occupations that provide no real service. Prisons, war, bureaucracy, sales, advertising, incentivizing people to consume, speculation, finance. Uh, imagine if all those people were actually engaged in things that produced real wealth and we curtailed our consumption, but also eliminated our debts. We need to take back our communities by suing those who have obtained their fortunes through fraud, in part. This would amount to a cashier's check to every citizen. And by the way, suing for this fraud, remember Obama sent not a single banker to prison, and the Securities and Exchange Commission, which would be the commission tasked with this sort of investigation, is the other agency with the lowest morale. And this new consumer watchdog agency is under the leash of the Federal Reserve, apparently, and the Treasury. Um, I would say that if we could pull back all the money that was earned through fraud by corporations and individuals, the cashier's check to every single individual in the U.S. would be between 10000 and 100000 U.S. dollars. And I would put that money towards eliminating all debt on land and property so that we get our communities back. We're not renting them from mega business. We can have a society where everyone makes the equivalent of $200,000 a year if everyone was involved in productive work and people valued time over consumption. Local businesses should buy from each other. People should patronize local businesses. Charitable free schools based on the humanities first, equipping people to think critically. So in my daughter's case, I've been trying to deal with their education in high school, and I really would like to teach them about the great philosophers, about really interesting things, but we've been too busy getting them stamped with these credits for me to actually be able to teach them and run my uh, other parts of my life. It's sort of an irony. We were too busy going to school to learn. And in fact, the principal at the school, when one of my daughters was doing badly, and hadn't gotten enough credits to prove she could graduate. She said, first of all, you're not allowed to repeat a year because there's no money, even though I'm paying plenty of taxes. It's my money. And um, second of all, she said, we can't. and I said, well, why doesn't she go to junior year at your school? And um, uh, she'll learn, and then we can transfer to community college. She says, well, we can't just have kids around here learning. So uh, this is... Um, why I'm interested in, in, in changing the educational system from a factory for uh, workers that are cowed and beaten uh, to a place where people can really think critically. You know, also every time that she comes home about China, for example, they always speak about China, of course, about how bad China is and how great we are. Every time they have any, uh, or they talk about imperialism, they never men mention America has conducted a hundred imperialist wars in the last century. And the good news, I talked to her teacher about history, and he said he didn't look at anything in terms of an imperial lens since the Spanish-American War. And now he is talking to, the, to my daughter about imperialism. So talking about these things can change people, can change the society, can change the culture. Reducing property taxes, if we could have a charitable-based uh, free education that was not public, not part of the system, that is. It would be public in the sense that it would be voluntary and not corrupted. That is my dream. Institutions for helping people to obtain debt-free housing, affordable medical care, without all the layers of insurance and speculation and lawyering around it. 
Probably we need a second constitutional convention or revolution even at this rate. And then there's the mystery of Barack Obama, a man who is either blackmailed or is a wolf in sheep's clothing. Many of my family and friends think he's really secretly a good guy struggling under an oppressive system. But look at his actions, and one in particular I would suggest looking at is golfing. Um, golfing with Bill Clinton, golfing, uh, 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 inviting celebrities to the White House, no bankers in prison, wars overseas, biggest arms sale in history to the most repressive governments in the world, all U.S. arms are sold through the State Department, um, $80 billion worth roughly to Qatar, United Arab Emirates, to Saudi Arabia, and then now they're uh, shipping his arms into Libya, into Syria, the last two socialist countries in the region other than Algeria. And um, he has given almost no press conferences. So I don't understand people think he's secretly a good guy. I fought for him very hard in the election, but I don't care really if he's secretly a good president. A good person, I should say. If I, if I was president, I would not sell the whole world out because I was afraid of threats against me and my family. I would rather take a bullet than sell the whole world out and the people who elected me. If I was worried about that, I wouldn't even run. And I, and I think he should, and any of us who is elected, should tell the real truth about the national security state, the sinister systems growing exponentially, the military-industrial complex. So Obama is either a coward or a traitor for the progressives who fought for him, or has a lot of explaining to do, and you mark my words, he will never explain these things in his entire life. He's clearly an egomaniac and a manipulator, and I hope I'm wrong. Our heroes are villains. The Chronicle reported on the Bradley Manning trial without any uh, just saying it was being deferred. It's actually very important what's going on there. The Newswire just says, oh, it's being postponed, but actually the, there's testimony going on about his torture, massive torture, not a single word about it in the AP wire that the Chronicle recirculates. And that brings me to Bradley Manning. So if you're interested in this case about Manning and his torture, here, there's plenty to be said about it, and it gets one byline, uh, of course, in the mainstream media. <clears throat> there's also a, a recent uh, interview with Assange, and um, here's another great hero. Assange uh, has released more, brought more evil secrets to light than any other person in the last 40 years and not compromise a single one of his sources. And he's being accused of Orwellian sex crime. And uh, I suppose Petraeus uh, is also guilty of sex crime and Allen thought crime of sex crime. General Allen, I ask you to have the courage to stand up to these villains and tell them we are on to their game and we won't be afraid and we won't be silenced, that their day will come, that Nuremberg has not been forgotten, and that the sooner they join us restoring a society without wealth inequality based on fraud. Aristotle and also um, the fellow who wrote about America from France, uh, Tocqueville, uh, in the 1830s, uh, they saw a society that had a very broad, wide, roughly middle class, and this is no longer the case, and it's a dirty word to mention the poor in politics now. It's a dirty word to talk about an upper class. Uh, other, you only hear the middle class being discussed, and although they do use the word the rich uh, occasionally. So the sooner that these people who are in power join us in restoring a society without massive wealth and equality based on fraud, turning us into a banana republic, and a rampant corrupt and media, a media and arms and correctional and finance complex that strangles prosperity by creating all this non-productive work, suggest a crying shame, and, uh, and also strangles even proper thinking. The sooner they join us, the better they will feel about themselves, and less severe their sentences will be on the day of reckoning, which can be postponed, but cannot be entirely avoided. And 
Uh, the one other article I wanted to mention and bring to your attention is this is a law uh, that is severely curtailing the right to demonstrate in the new Libya. So to conclude, have the courage to stand up to these villains and tell them we are on to their game. We won't be afraid and we won't be silent. So their day will come. The Nuremberg has not been forgotten. Run for office. Get active. Blog. Make videos. Talk about it with people. Talk about the security state, the military-industrial complex, the warfare state, the destruction of our constitution, the lawlessness of our government and our corporations. Read history. Read the, about the founders, if you like. Aristotle is truly the founder uh, that inspired our leaders. John Locke. Read of Benjamin Franklin of Jeffersonian democracy. Read and listen to Ron Paul and Gore Vidal. Be open to thinkers from both the right and the left. Convince the people living this media monoculture sham of a free press, sham of a democracy, that they are acting as shams, as a disservice to all. When is a man not a man? When he's a sham. Strengthen the sinews of your mind. Take back your nation, your democracy, your republic. My name is Alexander Hagen. Good night and good luck.